Good afternoon, everybody. My name is James Stoney. I'm from Leading Edge Wind Turbines. We manufacture wind turbines here in the UK, and I'm talking today about turbines about 15 kilowatts and less. So just quickly give, give an overview of what we're going to be talking about. Definitions and scale, uh, lots of terms like kilowatts and kilowatt hours. I want to quickly touch on that. Talk about the market size um, for smaller wind turbines in the UK principally. Uh, talk about off-grid systems where remote power is needed and typical applications for that. Then I'm going to discuss grid connected systems, so how you um, connect a wind turbine, how you collect the feed-in tariff and so on. Talk about the siting requirements of wind turbines, whether they're grid connected or off-grid, how you plan the project, how you install and maintain them, and then reach conclusions. So very quickly, sort of, uh, when we're talking about small turbines, we're talking about the little red one rather than the big one, which I think Chris is going to be talking about the larger scale turbines later. So 15 kilowatt turbines are, are typically on a sort of 15, 18, 20 meter uh, mast. Um, the turbine in the middle is a Gaia wind turbine. It's a two bladed turbine with a 13 meter diameter blade. Um, so it, it looks quite large in that photograph, but you can see the two little people there in the bottom right hand corner. Um, it's smaller than a mature tree, so at any kind of distance, you can't really see it. So it's, these are fairly kind of unobtrusive things which are good for powering um, up to powering a farm. So the types of turbines we're talking about are, go from uh, micro turbines up to 1.5 kilowatts. So a 300 watt turbine is about a meter in diameter. A 600 watt turbine is about a meter and a half and so on. So quite small increases in radius um, result in quite a large increase in the potential power of any turbine because the power is to do with swept area. If you remember pi r squared, r doesn't need to change much for the area to go up considerably. So a small turbine, a 1.5 kilowatt turbine, might do about 1,000 kilowatt hours a year. That's a megawatt hour. Uh, it's about a quarter of a typical household use uh, in any year. A typical household use is about 4,400 kilowatt hours in a year. Um, larger turbines, sort of five, six kilowatt turbines, uh, turbines like the Avance uh, and the Proven uh, five kilowatt turbine, now Kingspan, they'll do about 10,000 kilowatt hours a year. Um, one of the things we need to be a little bit careful about in talking about turbines is we tend to talk about turbines in, in power rather than energy. So uh, there's this kind of distinction between a six kilowatt turbine, which apparently is more powerful than a five kilowatt turbine. But actually what you need to do when you're choosing your turbine is work out what energy might be delivered by the turbine in any location, because that's the key thing. So the, the power is actually to do with the power at a particular wind speed. Typically that wind speed is not um, achieved most of the time. So you need to be very careful about confusing kilowatts and kilowatt hours. Um, the largest turbine shown here is a sort of um, 15 kilowatt turbine, and like I say, that's about nine meters in diameter. The other, very sort of quickly, the, the middle two, um, commonly sort of known as vertical axis wind turbines, some people call them sort of egg whisks, etc. So the difference is that the, the, the turbines spin on a, the vertical axis, um, often used in sort of, or often said to be good in turbulent conditions and rural, uh, sorry, urban locations. Um, so <clears throat> the, the sort of more conventional type of the, of the propeller type, because the, they have a larger swept area that's all facing the wind and all usable. A vertical axis, half the turbine is actually going into the wind, so isn't quite so efficient. If we look at the number of turbines installed in the UK, uh, there are about 20,000 installed to date. Uh, the majority of these are in the smaller sizes, less than 1.5 kilowatt, although recently with the growth of the feed-in tariff, the sort of range 1.5 to 15 has grown pretty steadily and is growing steadier still. Um, in the last couple of years, 15 kilowatt and above, again, driven by the feed-in tariff, is also growing, but in terms of the numbers, it's, it's still very small. So we're now going to quickly talk about off-grid applications, uh, just because these account for sort of 65% of the number of turbines sold in the UK. Um, you've probably seen these around um, on road signs, rail signs. Often that's where power is incredibly expensive to get to 
uh, you know, the road sign which says dangerous corner, you know, uh, a turbine will pay for itself almost immediately because the cost, the, it saves the cost of the cabling. Uh, domestic residential applications where turbines can actually, if, if the DNO, the dis distribution network operator, wants to charge a large amount to connect a, a property to the grid, it can be more cost effective just to put a turbine and some solar panels in. Um, so I'm just going to quickly skip through some other applications just to sort of show some nice photographs. I end up with a, a nice photograph of a boat in the Caribbean because the weather was miserable last week when I did this um, thing, but in fact it's turned quite Caribbean today. So um, just talking about the typical types of off-grid um, components, um, as the chairman said, you know, that we've got to kind of race through quite a complex subject here. So just going to quickly kind of touch on what you need to consider when you're looking at an off-grid system. Um, first of all, the, the key place to start is your loads, because unless you determine and minimise your energy use, uh, when you kind of work it all backwards, you end up with a huge um, kind of uh, requirement for solar panels and turbines. So it becomes more expensive. You've got to try and minimise what you're going to need. Um, that will also minimise the size of the battery that you need, um, because the, the size of the battery is dictated by how long you're prepared to go without any input from the solar panels and the wind turbine. Um, solar panels very often have their own charge controller. These are relatively cheap, um, so you can expand that relatively easily. In this case, we're, I'm using a diversion charge controller, which, which will monitor the battery voltage and will dump any heat as and when the batteries get up to voltage. Now we're going to talk about grid-connected turbines. Um, they're typically freestanding. Um, don't, you don't want to mount a turbine to your house for, for a number of reasons, uh, not least because you know, your house wasn't designed for that. Um, you won't get any decent production out of your turbine, and you know, don't ever buy a turbine for your to mount on your house. So this um, graphic from Renewable UK is a very good illustration of, of how a turbine generates electricity. And in the first instance, it goes, it gets used by the house or the farm or uh, whatever um, residence it's, it's uh, connected to. So that will save you buying electricity from the grid. Um, if there's any surplus, if you're generating more than you're using, it will be exported onto the grid. So you can see the little, there's an export meter at the bottom left there, which shows what, what you've exported. Now the feed-in tariffs, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail, are actually mostly paid where you've got a G there for your generation meter. So it will, it, you'll get, you get paid for everything that you generate, whether you use it or not. So you also get paid typically about three pence for what you um, export. Now your input, typically electricity is you know, anywhere between 10 and 20, 12 pence. So if you're generating and using your electricity, that's worth about 40 pence. Now, word of warning, we all know what the government has done to the solar tariffs. Um, they're about to do a similar thing to the wind turbine tariffs. Uh, across the board, it doesn't matter what size turbine you're, um, you're producing, sorry, installing. Where there used to be a differential for smaller turbines, they would get a higher rate. From October 2012, they're proposing 21 pence per kilowatt hour produced. So that's quite a shaving of the, of the amount of electricity of, that you're going to get paid. It's still twice what you pay for electricity. So um, in a way, it, it, perhaps it's, some would argue it's a more sensible incentive. Um, in order for you to collect the feed-in tariff in the UK, your turbines must be MCS certified, microgeneration certification scheme certified. Um, there are currently about 15 models, uh, slightly more variants, um, but 15 basic models that are certified. The full list is available at that rather long URL, which I've put up there, I'm not going to read it out. Um, and there are more being added uh, as we speak. Now, with wind turbines, the, you're harvesting a resource. The resource has got to be there. Um, you know, if, you're, if you don't have a good site, you might as well not bother um, because it's an expensive thing to do if it's a bad site. So the, the power in the wind is proportional to the cube of the wind speed. If you double the wind speed, you get eight times the power. Um, so if you double it twice, you're going to get 64 times the power. So there's considerable, um, it's considerably more energy where it's very, very windy. So check the winds, UK wind speed database for your area. That will give you a good indication whether or not it's windy. Um, monitor it if possible, install an anemometer. 
typically for at least three months. Um, otherwise, you know, you could be wasting your time. Seek your local installer's advice. They'll have probably installed turbines in your area. They'll probably have experience with particular models and be able to point you to you know, sites nearby, um, other places where they've had them installed for a year or two, and you can get a better indication of, of what you're going to um, get out of the turbine. But you know, like any investment, it's really important you do this research, because otherwise you can be disappointed. Um, it's very easy to overestimate the um, the power in the wind and what you're going to get out of it. Everyone thinks they live in a windy place, but it's not necessarily a good place for a turbine. So in terms of um, what you need to do to plan your uh, installation, um, you will need planning permission. There's recently been a general permitted development order which allows the connection of a turbine um, without planning permission, but the restrictions on that are so tight that effectively uh, it has to be a turbine about that size, that is MCS certified. Well, the largest turbine that's MCS certified is about five times that. So, effectively, the GDPO at the moment is useless. They are looking at introducing a non-residential GDPO, and that will help considerably. Uh, anecdotal evidence will suggest that planning permission is quite difficult to get, but actually about 75% of applications do succeed. So, the key thing is to sort of speak to your neighbours first. I've, I've had a number of clients who, you know, have just gone ahead. That, you know, the first thing their neighbours have seen about an installation is, is the, you know, the, the announcement in the local paper. And of course, the first thing that they think about is a turbine, like the beginning of the slide, absolutely enormous one megawatt turbine behind their house, and they're terrified. So, it's really important you educate people. Most people don't know about the sort of scale and size and noise of turbines, um, and it's the fear of the unknown. Once people know what's involved they're generally uh, supportive of it. Speak to a local authority, most of them, three years ago it's quite difficult, maybe more, um, you know, they weren't familiar with what turbines, they've now got their procedures and policies in place, they know exactly how to deal with an application, and the MCS certification has helped a lot with that. Provide as much information as possible with your application, you know, distances from uh, neighbours, noise, uh, and so on. Um, it's really important that you, you give a comprehensive application and you're much more likely to succeed. Um, the other critical thing is check that you can connect to the grid. Sometimes if you're in a very windy lo location, that's typically quite rural, um, often the grid can be quite creaky, um, so it may not be able to take the power that you're hoping to put into it. Um, and again, your MCS installer will be able to help you with that. There's just some photographs of a, of a sort of uh, 2.4 kilowatt turbine, uh, Skystream. This is the smallest turbine that is um, available on the MCS certification, uh, on the MCS list. The foundations are a block of concrete about two meters by two meters by a meter. Um, they are poured about four weeks before the turbine is actually installed. Um, you need that for the, the concrete to, to cure in order for you then to be able to raise the, the, the mast. Um, the turbine, uh, the, the installation of the turbine in the tower typically is, is in a day. Um, turbines of this size can be winched up by hand or by hydraulics um, or by pulled up literally by a tractor. Um, larger turbines will require you know, cranes depending on how large the tower is uh, and how large the um, turbine is. So we've had a bit of a whistle-stop tour of, of turbines and the technologies. Um, they can be an excellent source of energy, but really only in the right place. The key thing is location, location, location. Um, don't be tempted by cheap Chinese, I don't mean to be critical of the Chinese, but you know, don't be tempted by cheap turbines. You get what you pay for. Um, go for quality. Size matters. The bigger, bigger is better. It's to do with the swept area. That will determine the, the amount of energy you're likely to be able to harvest and get expert advice. There's plenty of very good um, MCS installers and manufacturers out there who um, are in, you know, really incentivized to make this a vibrant and thriving industry. Thank you very much.